everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Nathan Mariesh. I'm a TPM here in Google Devices and Services. Uh, if you've seen or held one of our new Pixel phones, you might be familiar with some of our work. But today, I'm excited to introduce a couple of brilliant guest speakers to speak on another exciting topic, creating medicines to heal and regenerate the damaged brain. As an avid fan and supporter of the advancement of regenerative medicine in general, it was but a coincidence that I had the pleasure of being introduced to Dr. Hal Lewis and Dr. David Margulis' new project. Today, they are joining us from their recently formed nonprofit, the Dan Lewis Foundation for Brain Regeneration Research. Dr. Lewis is a clinical and research psychologist and advocate for innovative programs to serve those with disabilities. Dr. Lewis held several director level positions at the University of Colorado School of Medicine for many years until his recent retirement. A relevant note is his work co-authoring a comprehensive guide for parent school teams to promote the success of students with brain injuries. While Dr. Lewis his professional interest in brain injuries goes back several decades. It was in 2007 that his son, Dan, suffered an unfortunate trauma of his own during a cross-country bike ride to benefit charity. Dr. Lewis has since taken his family's personal experience as motivation to further explore science for solutions. Dr. Margulis is a physician and executive with a long history of founding health services and biotech ventures in both the public and private sectors. His ventures spanned several successful exits, including acquisitions from the likes of WebMD and LabCorp. Dr. Margulis recently retired from the faculties of Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, where he played a leadership role in guiding the institutional strategy on genomics. In just a moment, you'll get to hear the personal story that inspired this work and also the promising science enabling it. For those with questions for our guests, you'll be able to ask your questions in the comment section on your screen, and we'll re reserve some time at the end for the presenters to respond to some of them. And with that, I'll turn things over to Dr. Lewis. Thank you for sharing your time with us today. We're here to tell you about our plans to catalyze the development of new medicines and biotechnological interventions for persons with serious brain injuries. We believe these advances will allow those with brain injuries to experience a meaningful recovery of brain functions. We will tell you why this almost unimaginable goal is now scientifically plausible. Following his sophomore year at Yale, my son, Dan Lewis, participated in a 4,000 mile cross country bicycling fundraiser for Habitat for Humanity. At roughly the 2,000 mile mark, Dan was hit by a speeding motorist he suffered multiple internal injuries and a devastating brain injury. I'm going to show you a three minute video in two segments that paints a picture of Dan pre and post accident. The first segment is from a video tribute created by his college friends shortly after the accident. In this segment, you will hear the acoustic cello group that Dan co-founded. The group is named Low Strung, playing their version of the classic rock song, Dream On by Aerosmith. On this track, Dan is playing the lead cello part. The second segment shows Dan in some rehab activities over the last few years.
does ball start with? B. What else starts with B? Big. Big. That's right. Here you go. There's a, the ball. Can you push it to me? Woohoo! All right. This ball is red. What does red start with? R. R. What does D-A-N spell? Dan. Dan. What does D-A-D -D spell? Dad. Dad. That's right. One. Three. Good. How about three over here? Good. Two. Down. The contrast is stark and striking. Dan is essentially a different person now. For many years after Dan's catastrophic injuries, my wife and I and Dan's younger siblings, Katie and Peter, experienced two different Dans. It was as if there were two different universes in which Dan existed. This experience is very common for families who have suffered severe brain injuries. It is an experience that is very difficult to reconcile with emotionally. The pain of realizing that a loved one has been so dramatically and negatively transformed in an instant, literally an instant, is very difficult to overcome. For years, I talked to many doctors and scientists about whether there was anything that could be done to speed up Dan's progress. The result of these conversations was almost always deflating. I read a lot about stem cell treatments and attended stem cell seminars. But the outcome data were not convincing and the evaluation methods were not sufficiently rigorous. I came to the realization that the medical science at that time was not yet sufficiently advanced to pursue this treatment for Dan. Several years ago, I began to search for information about other potential paths towards regeneration of brain. The idea began to germinate that I might not have to be resigned to the tragedy of Dan's life, that biomedical innovations might hold hope for significant improvement. I became aware that a multimodal approach, including genomically targeting drugs, bioengineered devices, computerized brain interfaces, and the newest stem cell methodologies in the context of aggressive rehabilitation did indeed hold hope for brain regeneration. A few years ago, I was speaking with David a friend since our childhood years. And David's situation and Dan's situation entered the conversation. We both had professional experience in neurological disorders and brain injury. Me as a clinical and research psychologist and David as a physician, as well as a bioinformatics and biotechnology expert. David picked up on my desire to do something transformational to help Dan and the hundreds of thousands of persons in the chronic stage of living with a severe brain injury. And so 
the seeds of the Dan Lewis Foundation for Brain Regeneration Research were planted. The overarching goal of the Dan Lewis Foundation is to pursue breakthroughs that will one day improve the lives of those affected by serious brain injury. We aspire to make a broad range of biomedical therapies available to people with such injuries. We will continue to raise funds and direct such funds toward the most promising biomedical therapeutics. By supporting programmatic research, the foundation aspires to expedite clinical trials, joint efforts between research institutions, biotech companies, individuals with brain injuries, and their families. A few months ago, the media buzz centered on Richard Branson's and Jeff Bezos' flights to the boundaries of outer space. Laudable in many ways. Clearly, there is a strong human impulse to explore the unknown and much to be gained from space exploration. To me, however, even more spectacular are the combined efforts of the neuroscientific and biotechnology communities to explore inner space, the inner space of the human brain. Admittedly, I've always been a fan of the film Fantastic Voyage and the book The Magic School Bus Goes Inside the Human Body. But seriously, to me, exploration of this inner space is of extraordinary value representing an exciting journey of nearly infinite complexity and immeasurable benefit. This is a journey that will delve into that part of us that makes us truly human, a journey into inner space, which seeks to improve the lives of millions of individuals and their families who have experienced severe brain injury. We're hoping for more than resignation and acceptance. We're hoping for real improvement in the capacity to function and participate in family and community life. I thank you all for letting us share this journey with you. And I look forward to our discussion at the conclusion of our talk. I'm going to turn the talk over now to David for a glimpse of the science that is inspiring the DLF. Thank you. Hello, I'm David Margulies. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Hal and I deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Aspiring to enable the seriously injured brain to regenerate is for most somewhere between audacity and lunacy. I'm going to try to persuade you that there's a realistic path to inducing regeneration in a damaged brain. Today, 5.3 million people in the United States, nearly 2% of the population are living with a consequence of a severe brain injury. While there have been advances in acute phase treatments, there are no meaningful medical therapies to stimulate brain repair and functional recovery beyond the first few months after an injury. The Dan Lewis Foundation has assembled a world-class group of neuroscience advisors who have volunteered to help us accelerate the creation of safe and effective drugs to stimulate brain regeneration. You can see our team of scientists on our website, danlewisfoundation.org, and a report of our first invitational meeting is posted there as well. We're an organization that will seek to influence the scientific agenda and help convene the key participants and catalyze key pieces of translational research. We're here today because we're seeking both additional funding and additional collaborators for the journey. Until recently, the prevailing belief was that the central nervous system has a very limited capability to heal after an injury. It was believed that humans are born with a full complement of neurons, that the damaged brain cannot repair itself, that developmental windows, once closed, stay closed, and that sensory receptive fields are irreversibly hardwired 
to corresponding regions of associative cortex. There was no plausible path to alter the developmental symphony of the brain in persons with either genomically mediated developmental defects or had suffered devastating brain injuries were, in principle, untreatable. Most recovery after a brain injury occurs in the first months after that injury. Some with severe brain injuries do continue to regain function more than a year or two after the initial injury. But for most, further recovery is both uncommon and quite limited. Modest functional recovery many years after an injury is not our goal. We are here to find ways of unlocking a more profound recovery of the seriously injured brain. A number of challenges must be surmounted in order to stimulate a brain to experience meaningful repair and regeneration after a serious brain injury. First, a brain injury must be precisely characterized both immediately after the event, over time, and in response to treatments. This requires the ability to perform functional imaging with resolution sufficient to detect changes in synaptic activity. Next, there need to be methods to stimulate the formation of new connections. Drugs which specifically target the genetic controls of synaptogenesis, which is the creation of new connections, or neurogenesis, which is the creation of new neurons, will be needed. If long tracts, like the corticospinal tract, which connects the cortex to lower motor neurons in the spinal cord are disrupted, then there need to be methods to restore this connectivity. If there's a substantial loss of brain tissue, it may be necessary to replace lost cells by inducing the formation of new neurons or by transplanting new cells into the brain. Biomechanical prostheses, that is computational and mechanical devices which supplement or replace brain functions, will be necessary to augment biomedical therapies. Many of you are familiar with the rapidly developing field of brain computer interfaces and likely some on the call are actively working in this space right now. Even with new medicines and new brain computer interface prostheses, intensive retraining will be required to induce maximal functional recovery. Now, before you conclude that causing a brain to regenerate is impossibly complex, recall that all of the instructions to build a brain are present in our DNA. Our job is not to create a brain, but rather to create the conditions that allow a brain to recreate itself. So let's take a brief look at some of the more important recent enabling advances. The first challenge that I mentioned was improved functional imaging. New radio tracers have been developed, which let one see areas of decreased or increased synaptic activity. In the left is an image, on the left is an image from an uninjured person. In the center is an image of a person with moderate cognitive impairment. And on the right is a person with fully developed Alzheimer's disease. Look at the area indicated by the arrow, which is the tip of the hippocampus, and note the decreased in activity. This happens to be measured with a particular radio tracer called SV2A as one progresses from the uninjured brain to the devastated brain. It's important to have non-invasive methods of measuring synaptic activity over time in a patient with brain injuries, especially in order to evaluate new therapies. This marker is but one of many promising approaches to this problem. Until recently, there was a limited understanding of how brains develop and why neurons in the brain and the spinal cord don't regenerate after an injury. Now there's an increasing understanding of how cells and connections in the brain are formed and can be induced to regenerate. It's long been unclear why certain tissues and organs regenerate, but others don't. In the past decade, there's been real progress toward understanding how to enable a damaged adult spinal cord to reestablish functional connections and the principles that have enabled this progress may well extend to unlocking regrowth potential in the brain itself. Here's one, of, one set of studies demonstrating the potential for self-repair in the spinal cord. Stephen Strittmatter from Yale and his colleagues learned that certain cells in the spinal cord secrete substances that actively inhibit regrowth of severed nerve fibers after a spinal cord, cord injury. These molecules block axons from growing new branches and prevent nerve cells from establishing new connections. Reducing the concentration of these inhibitory substances releases the cord to self-repair, to grow new branches, to establish new connections. One such inhibitory molecule that's been well studied is called NOGO A. This idea that release from inhibition can re result in regrowth has already been applied successfully in non-human primates. Specific drugs have been developed which downregulate NOGO A activity. 
These drugs appear to promote meaningful axonal growth and functional recovery in laboratory animals with spinal cord injuries. The image on the right is from a study demonstrating that blocking down regulators allows a monkey to regain its mobility after its spinal cord has been partially severed. One drug called Axer 204, designed to release spinal cord cells from regrowth repressors, is already in a phase two clinical trial with a readout expected in humans next summer. There are similar gene systems in the visual cortex, which prevent rewiring from the retina shortly after birth. The product of the Lynx-1 gene appears to downregulate plasticity in the visual cortex. It's been demonstrated that Lynx-1 and other inhibitory gene systems can be downregulated, thereby restoring the brain to a more plastic state and allowing visual reconnections. Mark Baer from MIT and his colleagues have demonstrated success with this general strategy in an animal model of amblyopia. They've succeeded in restoring plasticity to the visual cortex in order to permit reconnection between the eye and the brain, reconnections that would not ever occur otherwise. These down-regulating systems are now drug targets and the hunt is on to design or find drugs that will release the central nervous system from the inhibition of innate plasticity and repair mechanisms. Until recently, there were limited research methods for screening and testing new drugs for serious brain injuries and other CNS disorders. Now there are dramatically better methods to identify drug targets, efficiently screen drugs, and test the efficacy of potential new drugs. In the next slide, in the next slide you'll see patterns of electrical activity of human cells in culture. These patterns can be actively measured to determine whether a candidate drug is in, engaging with its intended target and thereby uh, uh, becoming a potential drug. So this particular slide, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you're looking at human neurons and culture uh, talking with each other. This is the academic and commercial work of Adam Cohen, Kevin Egan, Graham Dempsey, Louis Williams of Harvard and Q State Biosciences. In the clip at the bottom, you're looking at a dish of cultured neurons studied using all optical electrophysiology. These neurons were created from a person's skin cell. The cells were transformed into pluripotent stem cells, then guided to differentiate into neurons. Optogenetic techniques were used to allow these neurons to be fired when stimulated by a laser and to fluoresce when they fire. So you're watching this uh, network of neurons communicating in culture, both at rest and with pattern stimulation. In essence, we're eavesdropping on a neuronal network. We can then measure how neuronal communication is altered by either genetic or pharmacologic modification of the neurons. Different potential drugs can be added to the culture. Active compounds will alter the nerve firing patterns. Studying changes in the communication pattern of neurons using strong machine learning is an extremely sensitive way to screen for new potential drugs that can alter the ability of neurons either to create new synapses or to repair damaged axons. It's now possible to screen hundreds of thousands of compounds against thousands of different cellular targets in engineered human cells in order to identify com compounds with drug-like activity. These are the technologies that will help us find drugs that unlock the brain's ability to generate new connections, repair axons, and produce new neurons. Even given new systems for identifying and testing drugs for the brain, there were no drugs that directly activated or deactivated molecular pathways which directly control the creation of new neurons or synapses between existing neurons. It's now possible to design and synthesize molecules which specifically target and toggle these pathways on and off. Antisense oligonucleotides, called ASOs, are only one type of gene-modifying mo medicine that can be administered to directly control gene expression in the brain. ASOs are built from nucleotides, the basic building blocks of nucleic acids, including DNA. It's possible to create a small stretch of nucleotides, which can gain entry into a cell and specifically bind to a region of messenger RNA. These ASOs can be injected into the central nervous system, find their way to abnormal tissues, be taken up by cells in these tissues, and interact with very specific gene products being created in these cells, thereby upregulating or downregulating gene therapies, gene expressions, causing an increase or decrease of targeted proteins. Sudhir Agrawal recognized over 40 years ago 
that fragments of molecules with complementary sequences, these antisense molecules, would bind to and alter the activity of a cell's nuclear DNA or cytoplasmic mRNA. It took decades to learn how to design such molecules to be safe and effective drugs. We now believe that antisense oligos and other gene mod modifying medicines can be targeted against key regulators of neuronal development and as a result, cause the reactivation of brain, brain plasticity. One example of an antisense oligonucleotide that's transforming lives is a medicine called Spinraza, generically nusinersin, which is being used to treat a devastating disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is a rare hereditary genetic condition in which the connections between nerves from the spinal cord and the brainstem and the body's muscles just don't work properly. Before Spinraza, children with SMA type 1 almost invariably died very early in life. Today, more than 11,000 children with this disease have received this treatment and are now living nearly normal lives. If you got, get a diagnosis like SMA, you can only read about it and imagine a world where your child will probably uh, most likely not breathe on his own, uh, will have limited to no mobility, will have sh struggle to, s to swallow. And then all of a sudden you experience something radically different. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like you can't believe it. We watch him sit up and play with his sisters and live a life that he was not supposed to have. The fact that the drug has had such a positive impact on my son is amazing. We're overjoyed with that, but I'm really excited for our extended friends in this community that we're a part of, for their children to be able to receive this drug. It can't happen soon enough. There's an explosion of activity in the field of antisense oligonucleotides. You can't walk 100 yards in Cambridge, Massachusetts without bumping into someone who's using an ASO as a tool compound or as a drug candidate. Now, the plan is to design antisense oligos and other genomically targeting medicines, which may allow the mature central nervous system to regenerate tissue that has been destroyed or damaged in a severe brain injury. Now, even as we look for drugs to stimulate synaptogenesis and neurogenesis, a complementary approach is to provide the injured brain with compatible cells that either are or will become neurons. The goal is to cause these replacement neurons to engraft and form new connections. Cultured neurons contain the donor's genome and so can be transplanted back into the donor without immunologic tissue rejection. Some recent small scale studies suggest that autologous stem cells can help restore function in a damaged spinal cord and perhaps in an injured brain. It's even been possible to coax a small number of stem cells grown in culture to grow into an organoid, a walnut-sized piece of tissue that has many structures that are strongly suggestive of the anatomy and connectivity of an intact brain. These organoids have coherent electrical activity. The implication of these advanced cell culture techniques is that cultured neurons contain the information to self-organize into complex brain structures. As I said earlier, all of the instructions to build a brain are present in our DNA and our job is not to create a brain, but rather to create the conditions that allow a brain to recreate itself. Even as new medicines are designed and new sources of cells are created, there's a tremendous amount of work underway, including projects at Google, to directly connect the central nervous system with peripheral nerves and muscles using biomechanical prostheses and advanced signal processing. With little further introduction, I'm going to play a clip from the Neuralink's and the Neuralink team's work. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. He's learned to interact with a computer 
for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone, just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. Neurons in this region modulate their activity with intended hand movement. For example, some might become more active when he moves his hand up, and others when he moves it to the right. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict Page's intended hand movements in real time. First, we calibrate the decoder by recording neural activity as Pager uses the joystick to move a cursor to targets presented on the screen. As he's playing this game, we are wirelessly streaming, in real time, the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. He's focused, and he's playing entirely of his own volition. It's not magic. The reason Neuralink works is because it's recording and decoding electrical signals from the brain. Great game, Pager. And what better reward for a monkey than a banana? We still have challenges spanning many fields of engineering, so if you're good at solving hard problems and want to change people's lives, even if you've never worked with the brain before, we would love to hear from you. Uh, earlier, I laid out major challenges to in inducing brain regeneration. These were the challenges I laid out. As you've seen, there are serious efforts underway to address many of the challenges en route to drugs to stimulate brain regeneration. Uh, the first is that new imaging techniques, which will help to characterize the injured brain over time and in response to treatment, have been identified. Advanced instruments that can measure the electrical activity of human neurons as they connect and communicate with each other have been created, and these measurements can be used to find drugs that can stimulate new connections between neurons. It's already possible to engineer neurons that can be injected directly into specific brain regions, uh, which can engraft and can improve certain functions. Certain genes which control the formation of new neurons, new connections, and axonal repair have been identified. Drugs are being developed to influence these gene systems to stimulate the uh, key process, processes of brain regeneration. Uh, Antisense oligonucleotides have been designed against specific gene expression targets, and they're already being used to treat certain devastating brain disease. It should be possible to target genes which are down-regulating the brain's regenerative programs and thereby allow brain regeneration. And finally, brain-computer interfaces are advancing quite rapidly. Advanced machine learning and signal analysis techniques are uh, enabling both afferent and efferent connections to the brain. These brain-computer interface technologies will enable people to both perceive and control their environments in ways that were science fiction until recently. Specific devices and prostheses will reactivate paralyzed limbs convey visual information to blind persons, and integrate sensory information and intention into consciously controlled behaviors. Now, that, uh, it's unfortunate that the Neuralink uh, video didn't project its sound. I just want to reiterate what was happening. 
The monkey had an implant. The implant monitored electrical activity in the region of the brain that controlled its hand movement. The monkey was trained to move a joystick to follow a cursor. A computer interface tracked the electrical activity that controlled that cursor movement. Finally, the monkey was able to uh, move the cursor on the screen even without any uh, a physical connection to the screen. So uh, I hope uh, well, the time is now right and the stage is now set for biomedical and biotechnology communities to focus on new drug therapies. And in the context of the enormity, both of the need and the challenge, this organization, the DLF, will attempt to play a catalytic role. We'll convene, we will advocate, and we will fund critical translational research efforts. And I hope that we've captured your imagination and that you will choose to support our efforts by charitable contribution and by focused collaborations where possible. Thank you very much. And now we'll return it back to Nathan. Thank you. Thank, thank you both uh, again for speaking with us today. Quite, quite the touching story uh, from Dr. Lewis today. Also the promising science uh, on the horizon. Uh, a lot of different, uh, uh, I think, uh, elements of science coming together to make something this complex, uh, you know, potentially within reach. Um, just a few moments before we get into uh, our, our uh, Q&A, uh, just to reiterate, um, yeah, we, we have gotten uh, the DLF um, approved in Benevity. So uh, with uh, Giving Week um, being upon us, uh, I'm sure they would certainly appreciate any support if you're uh, interested. Um, uh, so again, for those uh, submitting questions, you can do that in in the uh, comments section, and we'll we'll get to those in a moment. I did want to start off uh, with a few of uh, my own. So, uh, Dr. Lewis, uh, uh, starting with you, um, with all you've been through, I uh, was wondering how you and Dan and your family were were uh, doing today. Uh, well, Dan is doing remarkably well. Uh, of course, how you view his progress depends on the perspective that you're taking. Um, given that his initial injuries were so catastrophic, and given the, um, the really dire prognoses that we received, and this was just over 14 years ago. Um, from up close, from that perspective, from my perspective, he's come a long way and he's doing very, very well. Um, he was in a coma for uh, the first year, basically. And it was, he was in a series of hospitals in several states um, but after about, uh, after about a year, he was able to come home. So that was the first big hurdle. Um, he wasn't able to speak his first words um, until about four years post-accident. Now he can speak in two and three word phrases. He can make choices verbally. Um, and his motor skills are somewhat improved. Um, his cognitive skills are better. He can do simple addition. He can um, spell some simple words. He can recite the alphabet and so on. Um, so to me, the progress looks remarkable. But from a more distant perspective, he's still in a very dependent state. Um, he requires a great deal of care. Um, his ability to independently initiate activities is extraordinarily limited. So, you know, um, for a couple of years after his accident, my mom, when I talked to her dance grandmother, would ask me, um, so has Dan made any progress? What progress has Dan made this week? And I finally wound up telling her, look, mom, Dan um, is starting on the goal line on a hundred yard field, uh, football field. And each week, maybe he moves forward a couple of inches. So it's going to take a long, long time. Um, but He's uh, 
completely cooperative. He's game. He he's, uh, tries hard to do whatever's asked of him. He's in, either in a calm mood or basically a good mood pretty much all the time. And, um, you know, so we're very grateful for that. And his basic health has improved a great deal. Or, you know, no longer worried that he's, you know, in mortal danger. Um, in terms of our family, um, my dad's mom passed away in 2014 um, of cancer. Um, I'm convinced that um, the stress and the emotional pain that she experienced related to Dan um, was a factor. Um, but in addition, she herself was a uh, pediatric rehabilitation psychologist with a great deal of expertise in brain injury. And um, she authored many articles and uh, book chapters and um, a well-known book on uh, helping kids and families with brain injury. Um, and she, clinically, she helped so many kids with brain injury progress um, quite a bit. And I think it was really difficult uh, for her to have all this knowledge and skill, and yet there was so little that she could do um, to accelerate Dan's recovery. So I think that was really hard for her. In terms of Dan's siblings, you know, they had a rocky road dealing with uh, Dad was their big brother, and he, um, you know, he set the tone for um, uh, accomplishment and service, and in many ways, uh, they looked up to him. So it was tough for them, but I think they, they've demonstrated their resilience over the last 14 years after getting um, getting going again. They're both uh, uh, very creative, inventive, and they, um, uh, they both have uh, good careers um, in helping professions that they're pursuing. And I, I think they've, um, you know, they, they're doing well. Um, so, you know, for me, I've learned a great deal about um, policies and healthcare services and reimbursement systems and um, therapeutic techniques. And one of the major uh, steps forward for me emotionally was hooking up, connecting again with David a couple of years ago and realizing that there was a, a very, very open and promising research field um, in the area of brain regeneration. So that's been absolutely delightful. Of course, I'm very thankful to David. You can see from his presentation. And I think in some ways he's uh, uh, hit upon the tip of the iceberg in some ways. Um, he's a, a brilliant uh, physician and scientist and um, so appreciative of his efforts for the foundation. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, actually on that note, um, I did have some questions on the science uh, side of things, but uh, certainly uh, it's, it's taken a lot of strength, I think, on behalf of your family and others that, that have, have uh, to, to deal with um, such, such challenges. Um, so I did have a question. So one, one of the therapeutic uh, candidates was that was mentioned was the, uh, I try to get the name right here, but uh, uh, targeting antisense uh, oli, uh, oligonucleotide, and or ASO for for short, um, what, what what kind of, um, what would be involved in creating uh, that, that type of therapy or, or therapeutic? So as I indicated, these are fragments, uh, synthes they're synthesized molecules that are DNA or RNA-like. The, what's 
wonderful about these molecules is as soon as you know the gene sequence of the target, you can then very rapidly design an antisense that will interact in a complementary manner with that molecule and have the desired effect, either upregulating or downregulating the, uh, the gene expression uh, uh, pattern. So one can design antisense oligonucleotides in a matter of days or weeks. There's then substantial amount of work to, to test and to determine uh, dosages and toxicity. Uh, the, a, a piece of work led by Dr. Timothy Yu at Boston Children's Hospital, published in the New England Journal of Medicine about a year ago, has set the pace in less than a year. He went. Uh, he he took a child who didn't have a diagnosis, performed full genome sequencing, identified the gene target, synthesized the antisense oligo, ran through a rigorous drug development process, uh, went went through and got uh, authorization from the FDA and administered the drug to the child in less than a year. So where normal drug development can take decades and cost hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, even at low volume, antisense oligonucleotides are remarkably um, precise, relatively safe, and much less expensive to develop. I guess, is, is it fair to say that we're moving more from a model of drug discovery to that of design, um, as, as we've seen? With... That is a, that's a great way of characterizing, uh, as many on the call will understand, putting a, a timeline to science is difficult. Putting a project plan to engineering is, is still difficult, but much, much easier. The, between the model systems, the uh, all optical electrophysiology and the antisense oligonucleotides, and the vast databases of gene expression products, such as brain span, it, we're, we're now going to identify what the targets are, then design these drugs, the, these drug-like molecules. And as I mentioned in the talk, antisense oligonucleotides are only one of a, a group of genomically targeting medicines. So you, you then design them, you can test them at high throughput, and you can administer them fairly rapidly. So it's, it's, it, it's, we're progressing at unimaginable speed. Frankly, the, the barriers are more regulatory than they are now scientific and engineering. Well, one more question uh, from myself, and I think then we'll, we have a few coming in from the audience. So uh, I wanted to ask, uh, so you, you mentioned uh, a call for new collaborations. So I, I suppose you know, <clears> that could be a mix of funding technology or, or pools of patients. Um, did you have any in particular in, in mind in this regard? Sure. Now, in, in this live uh, 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 presentation, I, we've learned that the audio didn't work. So the link at the end of my talk, which was from Elon Musk's Neuralink company, may not have been interpretable by the audience, but that was an example of an advanced brain computer interface. I'm aware of a number of initiatives inside of Google at each of the steps of going from a piece of wetware, a brain, all the way through to an intact prosthesis. So there's, there's uh, flexible electrode pro uh, projects, there's links with, with, uh, with uh, uh, there are, the machine learning algorithms for analyzing signals, for predicting behaviors, the, the encoding, decoding problems are a subject of, of uh, tremendous activity. So I'm gonna guess that there are dozens or hundreds of individuals working inside of Google on components of this problem. So it would be spectacularly accelerating if we could mobilize some of that talent uh, into the community for the purposes of uh, creating uh, brain prostheses. So that's so. We're, clearly, we're looking for for a charitable contribution, but uh, the collaborations with Google engineers could be could be extraordinary. Uh, one last comment in that regard: there are other devices, there are other similar projects with uh, brain computer interfaces, which will use the cell phone as the device which reads feedback and projects into the central nervous system. So, those are the classes of collaborations. So I think right now um, we have a few minutes left, so we'll, we'll take a few uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, first one uh, is from Sasha. Um, she thanks you for your uh, work. Um, she asks, uh, have you considered doing a study on hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Um, which are, for sure. short, this would be HBOT and TBI. Sure. Uh, Sasha, thank you for that question. So there is, a, there is kind of a, an extensive literature on hyperbaric oxygen therapy particularly in the acute phase after an injury. And there is some effectiveness uh, under some circumstances. That, so your, your biologic reasoning is intact. There's, I'm not aware of studies in the chronic phase long after the, 
the, uh, the uh, recuperation processes have stabilized. It appears that the windows for plasticity and regeneration get locked off somewhere between three and 18 months after the acute injury. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, this question is from uh, Andy. Uh, the question is, can these drugs and techniques uh, be used to help people with brain injury resulting from stroke? Andy, great question. So the, the Hal has taught me that the, the field of brain injury has uh, many different um, uh, component, uh, uh, many different sets of families. Acquired brain injuries are rather different from traumatic brain injuries. And they're, of course, underlying genetically mediated developmental brain injuries. The principle of finding the gene, the gene expression pathway that controls either formation of new synapses or formation of new neurons or stimulation of axonal repair pertain in all of these injuries. The role of, I personally suspect that some of the brain computer interface technologies will initially find success in persons who have had highly localized strokes, because there the identification of the of the the, uh, the target outcome is cleanest and uh, most discreet. After a, a devastating brain injury, like Dan uh, realized, uh, there's there's a pervasive injury to the brain. So great great question. Yeah, um, I just yeah, one other ahead. comment in that regard. Um, it uh, for many years there have been sources of funding and sources of service provision that are available in, in many states for people who have experienced a traumatic brain injury, but those same sources of funding and service provision may not be available for people with acquired brain injury. And that's one reason that many folks in the brain injury community are wanting to um, sort of do away with the division between acquired brain injury and traumatic brain injury um, so that there's more uh, equality basically in terms of uh, the funding and services available. Okay. Well, th thank you so much again uh, for joining us today. And a reminder to the audience, um, the, the charity is can be found under the uh, Dan Lewis Foundation at uh, go slash give. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, we will have a um, recorded version of this uh, available for, for viewing in which we'll, um, we'll recreate the, uh, the audio tracks that we had a little trouble with today. But uh, thank you again so much, uh, uh, David and Hal, um, very, very, uh, you know, I think very impactful topic, but also a very promising one um, where there's there's a lot of, it takes a lot of pieces to, to um, I think have a promising outlook on this. And a lot of the science seems to be uh, at least uh, show, showing some, some real uh, promise. Uh, so th thank you again. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Nathan. Thank, thank you, Nathan. Thank you. And did, did you, uh, did you want to share a, a website uh, for those that want to learn uh, more? Uh, sure. It's www. W. Dan Lewis Foundation dot org. And uh, there's a great deal of information there about our board of directors, our scientific advisory board. Um, there's a tab for news and events. And, um, you know, we have uh, PowerPoints available. Uh, we also have uh, the report posted now on an event that we had in August, which was our first annual summit meeting um, on brain regeneration research. It was attended by 20 wonderful preeminent neuroscientists and biotechnologists, and it was just a, a great event. We, the report is extensive and specific about the research directions that we will be pursuing. Okay. So. Well, thank you everybody uh, once again for thank joining you. us at uh, Talks with Talks at Google. Thank you.